Okay, great. Well, I'll go, I'll go ahead and get started. Thank you all for coming. I hope you guys are having a great Lenaro Connect so far. This is my first Lenaro Connect. Uh, but I've been asked by my colleagues to come here and present a little bit on the things that we're doing with Ultra 96 and where people can get more resources on doing things with Ultra 96. And so we came up with the idea for doing, designing your own custom coprocessors and the acceleration hardware with Ultra 96. So if I haven't said so already, my name is Kevin Carrick. I'm with Avnet. We work with Xilinx on Ultra 96. Uh, I have a little bit of information on Ultra 96 V2, which we launched last week. So uh, that's a little bit uh, of something new, that's new this year for Lenaro Connect. Uh, but my colleagues, they asked me to put together something, and we worked really hard on coming up with something. So first of all, let me ask the room, is there any ARM folks in here? Okay, you guys might want to close your eyes and cover your ears for this next part. Because first of all, I want to kind of co cover some history on accelerators and coprocessors just so we can kind of understand where we've been in the past so that we can understand where we want to go. So can anybody tell me what this thing is here? That's right, Intel 386 processor. Ancient technology, but state of the art for its day. Yeah. So, how about this one? That's right, it's a coprocessor. I'll give you a kit for that one. So, why would anybody want to buy a coprocessor? What, what good was it? Why this extra part? It's a great answer. So it does floating point way faster than the main processor did. And so what you'd have to do is you'd have to get a motherboard that looked a little bit like this. So you'd have to have a bigger board, more power, but for those who had it back in the day and you needed to do the floating point operations and you had programs that were compiled with the compiler flag turned on to include that instruction set, you're getting much better execution than those who didn't have that. So Luckily for me, I, I didn't have one of these when they came out, but my dad helped me find one out of the dumpster, so it was a really great option for me. When my sisters were playing on the 486DX, uh, I had a little machine on the side that I could play with and do some code development. So, next slide right here. This one's also a little bit uh, NSFW for the ARM folks, so check out those circuits right there. So. If you imagine a lot of this stuff, you know, they had some automation tools for doing this back then, but if you were going to do this by hand nowadays, it'd probably take you a long time if you're going to do your own accelerator for a chip. And so uh, the things I'm going to talk about in this course are going to show you some of the resources that you can go to and look at to help you speed your own accelerator design. But the idea here is that when Intel did their own acceleration chip back then, it gave them a really good head start against the competition. Just now, you know, people are starting to catch up 30 years later. And um, something that I can relate to, maybe some, some folks in the room can also relate to that as well. So some of the other coprocessors that you see nowadays, you see GPUs. Uh, Craig actually covered some of this stuff in the, in the last course. You have DSPs that do signal processing calculations a lot faster. And then now we're also starting to see the emergence of very specialized processing units. So this is a Xilinx DPU that's implemented inside the programmable logic. The Bitmain guys a while ago, they provided a course, uh, covered some of the TPU accelerator that they have. So lots of acceleration going on. This is where people can add their value, add their custom IP and get ahead of their competition. Um, if you want to find out more about what Craig covered in his course, I put the course number up here so that you can check that one out as well. So, custom coprocessors and acceleration hardware. Where is the advantages of using an ASSP? Where is the advantage of using a two-chip solution? Where is the advantage of using ASIC? And where is the advantages of using a Zinc Ultra Scale Plus? So you can see there are a lot of advantages of using, using ASSP. The big disadvantage is flexibility. If you don't have the peripheral set that you need on that ASSP, it's too bad. Uh, maybe if you show up with a suitcase of money, that chip manufacturer will make you the chip peripheral set you need, but if, they, if you don't have the suitcase of money, good luck. Uh, Two-chip solution. 
Yeah, you can add another chip on there to get that functionality that you need, but you're going to pay for it in terms of power. So you got an extra chip that you got to feed power. And then your unit cost for your end, end product, that's going to be increased because now you got two chips going inside of it instead of one. If you're doing an ASIC, like the Bitmain guys, yeah, that's definitely an option, but there's lots of negatives, there's lots of risk. If you don't know what you're doing, you're going to pay a lot of money for nothing. That, and the time to market, those guys probably spent quite a bit of time trying to figure out exactly what they wanted to put inside their chip before they put down the money to spin a chip. Uh, in terms of flexibility, once you commit to doing that silicon, there's very little things that you can do in order to change thing, the way it, it performs. You're stuck with a hard piece of silicon. And then scalability is kind of a minus because, uh, yeah, it's really expensive to build bigger chips on, on the various processes that they have. So that takes me to the Zinc Ultra Scale Plus. It solves a lot of these problems. It adds a lot of flexibility. If you get something wrong inside your design, you just go back, you rebuild the bitstream, you load a new bitstream. In fact, you can load it over the air if you have a network connection to your end device. Um, the only you know, neutral area here is the unit cost. Craig definitely covered this a little bit. It's not cheap, not as cheap as the ASSPs, but in terms of value, uh, you're getting a lot more value out of a chip that you can just provide an over-the-air update to in order to change the functionality. So, programmable logic. Um, just kind of give you a background. My, I have a software background. I went back to school. Uh, I took a few graduate classes on FPGAs. That's how I landed my job at Avnet. Uh, they asked me, oh, do you know something about FPGAs? And I said, well, I took a class on it. Um, and they said, okay, well, can you write a bunch of test software to test uh, out these FPGAs, and so that's how I got into this business. But get a lot of questions on what's programmable logic. So uh, your basic unit inside of an FPGA is a logic block. So inside of the logic block, we basically have these three elements. We got a lookup table, which is a combinatorial logic piece that you can build, and that functions as a read-only memory. Um, through that lookup table, you get a constant electrical delay, and you're really only limited by the number of inputs and outputs, not the complexity of the logic function that you stick inside of that table. The output of that goes up to a carry chain, and then you, the result is also um, stored in some sort of latching device, so uh, it's usually some sort of flip-flop. But basically, the overall picture is that given a set of inputs, you're going to get a deterministic output and you're going to give it within a very finite amount of time. So if you zoom back out of the FPGA fabric a little bit, uh, here you see we have our little logic block right here. That's one of those little tiny red squares. Uh, you also have routing resources. So in between the little red squares, you got these wires. So basically, moving from left to right, you can configure any of these logic block resources to connect to any of these other logic uh, elements on the board using these high-speed routing resources. So the green pads, those are all input-output blocks, so you can use those as electrical inputs. You can use some of them as electrical outputs. They're configurable. CLBs are a lot configurable logic block resources. Embedded memory is the purple guy right here, so you can store your result inside of memory and do more advanced computations. And then they also have DSP blocks that'll do uh, multiply accumulate as well. So we're slowly building our way back out to kind of understand what are we talking about when we say FPGA or programmable logic. So uh, if you look at the device here on the left, this is the smallest Spartan 3A device mask showing 1,584 logic cells and 108 I.O. pins. So this would be about the time when I got into FPGAs. This was like state-of-the-art technology back then. And then today on Ultra 96, uh, it's this little board right here, Ultra 96 comes with the ZU3 device, and that gives you 145,000 logic cells and 82 I.O. pins. So we're constrained on the I.O. pins because we have to fit into the Ultra 96 format. There are larger pack package options, which would give us more options. But in terms of logic resources, you can say, you can see we're almost, uh, let's see, that's about 100 times larger than the device that we had 15 years ago. Okay, 
So what can you do with programmable logic? That's the next thing. So this is taken from Dan Roswood's Lenaro Connect presentation last fall in Vancouver, where he talked about managing custom FPGA accelerators with a tool called SDSOC. So that he goes into this a little bit more detail, but I'm going to give you the high level overview, where basically we have matrix multiply, and we have a golden function that's written in C code. So you can take this C application, you can run it through your GCC compiler, and you can run it on the processor. You could also take that same function, kind of go through and analyze, okay, which pieces are being, which pieces can be done in parallel, and you can break up that function, and you can wrap some pragmas around it. Uh, we have this Pragma HLS pipeline that we've wrapped around that, and you're basically telling SDSOC that you, it can take the liberty of pipelining that function out, and you're basically unrolling that loop into something that can be converted into HDL language and then implemented inside of the, pro, uh, the programmable logic. So this is basically a C to Gates type application. So when you run it through the tool, what you'll get is you'll get this Vivado block diagram. So Vivado is the, the primary Xilinx design tool. So here we can see um, the processing system of the Zinc Ultra Scale is hidden behind this Zinc Ultra Scale logic block. And through high speed XE interconnects, and some other glue logic that the SDSOC tool sets up for you automatically. You don't, it's kind of a complex design, but it's wrapping a lot of this complexity up for you. It creates this little accelerator block that gets dropped into that block diagram for you based upon that C code uh, that I showed on the previous slide. So it does a lot of this work for you. So from a software developer's perspective, this saves you a lot of time. You don't have to sit down and connect up a lot of these little, you know, from one point to the next point, connect the dots type of thing. The tool is automatically doing a lot of this stuff for you, and it, it implements these accelerators on the system, and it saves you a lot of time. So I don't know if the person, I'm in the middle of a discussion with somebody on Discord who's asking me some details on how some of this stuff works. I don't know if they're in the room. But uh, I did get, gather some information on this. So basically what Dan did when he, um, tried to show some real measurements of what does this acceleration actually mean? Can you really get 30x performance? He took uh, apples to apples comparison of that code. So his functional accelerator designs, he tested one at running at a fabric clock of 100 megahertz, and then he tested it again running at 300 megahertz. And this is what he found. So um, not changing anything else inside the system, at 100 megahertz, he gets a speed up of about 24x, and so he does that comparison by measuring the number of CPU cycles he spends inside of the matrix multiply function in the software on the CPU. Then it reruns it again using the hardware accelerator version of it that gets executed, um, launched from the processor, but the calculation's done inside the programmable logic inside the hardware. And he has a little timer. He just counts the number of ticks that happen on the timer. And so based upon those number of ticks, that's where he gets the speed up factor. So running at 100 megahertz, he gets about 24x improvement. He reran the same thing, changing only the fabric clock to speed up the matrix multiply calculation, and he gets a speed up of about 38x. So uh, if you look at that, you may look at that and you'd say, well, if I go from 100 to 300, that's about 3x. How come I can go from 24x to something that's three times 24. How come it's only going to 39x? And so what you're looking at is only about a 1.6 per x increase. And I'll have an answer to that in just a second, but I have to cover something in the meantime in order for this to be understandable. So when the programmable logic has that three times faster clock, why don't you have that 3x improvement? And to answer that, you have to remember that the data is moving into the programmable logic and it moves back out of the programmable logic to the, the processor memory space. And so when you're moving that, it has to go all across the high-speed axis interconnect. And if you don't change the fr clock frequency of that high-speed axis interconnect, that becomes your bottleneck of your system. So even though you're running the fabric faster and the actual calculation itself is running faster, you're not able to move that data back because you're not changing the data motion network. You got a question? Yeah. So uh, when when you move data from 
yeah, from your program over to the hardware logic, how does that happen in practice? Is it memory mapped I.O. and just some magical register writes appear in your code and then trig something with a bit and then it waits for Polstat to go to come out of the logic, something like this, or an interrupt, or how does it happen? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. So if I understand your question, you're just basically asking, what does that look like from a software perspective? Yeah, if you would disassemble the result, what would it look like? Yeah, so from, from a high-level perspective, um, the very simplest programmable logic accelerator looks like a piece of memory mapped registers. So you write something into it, hit like a go button, and it would go off and do its calculation, and then you'd wait for like an interrupt to come back from that. Um, there's more advanced models, um, like this one, in, I think that we're showing here, this one is like a DMA model, where basically it has a, wrap, a DMA wrapper around it, that there's some higher level calls that you can make from C that automatically sets all that up for you, and then the DMA engine handles moving the data from the processor into the programmable logic space for you. There's some other models that they had, um, I've seen one where they're using like the Snoop controller unit to move the data between the processing system and the programmable logic. So basically the programmable logic can see the same memory space that the processor sees. So there's a few different ways of doing the same exact thing, even though you're using different data models. And uh, there's a few of those that are supported by SDSOC. So, so a few years back, and I think also RISC-V does this, is like insert bogus instructions that will trigger something. You don't do that. Uh, that's a good question. So you're basically saying, uh, if I understand the question, saying are you saying like you have to insert a bunch of no ops and wait for the hardware accelerator? No, what what, the, what they're doing is uh, come up with new custom instruction in this, the ISA. They extend the ISA with some magical new instructions. You're you're not doing that. No, not okay. that I've seen. No. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Okay. So then, is there a limit to where we're going with all this? So there's a law out there that's called Amdahl's law. This is something that Amdahl observed quite a while ago. And it's basically the law of diminishing returns. And due to the losses in efficiency of parallelism, you can throw more and more hardware at a problem, and you will get an increase in performance, but it's a diminishing increase in performance. And so uh, you can find mo out more information on it. But basically, you know, you can throw some parallelism at it, and you can get good return. And then the more and more parallelism you throw at it, the more you're going to pay in terms of power, but then the, the worse return on investment you're going to get in the long run. So you kind of have to find this balance between the amount of accelerators that you're going to throw at a problem and the amount of speed up that you're going to get as a result of it. But the high level summary is that programmable logic really shines. So uh, if you break the computation problem up into smaller pieces and you create a customized and dedicated accelerator, you can provide resources specifically to handle a particular problem that you're trying to solve. And in the SDSOC created programmable logic so solution for matrix multiply, uh, when we evaluate the resources that we had at hand on the Ultra 96 board, and you provide, provide enough resources, you can get down to about 40 to 64 processor clocks for each matrix multiply operation. So programmable logic implementation compared to processor only implementation. Uh, processor on average takes about 1,542 processor clocks per matrix multiply for that given size of matrix. And the hardware acceleration does require additional resources, including the power to power the programmable logic. But the performance per watt for some of those math intensive calculations is better than when you get with a standalone processor. Yep, I got a question. Let me get you in the microphone. Well, the other thing is, it is a completely separate processor. So you could have the main CPU going off and doing other work in the meantime while this is doing the acceleration. Yeah. So you actually get you know, quite a bit of performance out of it. Yeah, that's a good observation. So the, the thing that you're elaborating on, since it's a separate process, separate hardware, you could set up an elaborate scheme to well, are you allow that one to go off, and maybe he generates an interrupt when he's done. But in the meantime, the processor can go off and perform some other work. It could be running your web server that's not really, you know, real-time sensitive. No, that's a good observation. Okay, so now that I've gotten you all excited about generating your own accelerator, where do you go from here? So we get lots of questions on like, well, where do I start? It sounds really great. I want to use the FPGA stuff. Uh, I haven't really used it before. Where can I get started? So I'm going to share with you my top five Ultra 96 developer resources. So number one, 
This is something we're going to announce officially at the end of the month, but I'm kind of giving a little bit of a sneak preview here at Lenaro Connect. We're coming out with a set of Avnet technical training courses that cover the hardware development, software development, uh, getting the Xilinx Petal Linux tools up and running. It'll give a walkthrough of using SDSOC. Uh, there'll be some more advanced courses that come out later on. I don't know if those will be announced by the end of the month, but um, I'm going to walk through some of the, the ones that we show here. Another big, very, very excellent resource is the Adam Taylor blogs and projects. And so Adam Taylor actually gave a presentation last fall at the Vancouver event. Uh, he's been working with Xilinx for a really long time. And Xilinx actually gave him a, uh, this is probably about like six or seven years ago, they gave him a micro Z kit, Adam Taylor edition. And ever since he got that, he's been blogging. He has over 300 different blogs that he's created. Starting with the Zinc 7000 family, he's doing the Zinc Ultra Scale Plus stuff now. And so I'll show some of that stuff. There's also documentation reference designs available on the Element 14 website. I'll talk a little bit more about what that is. We also have support forums and there's a community portal that I want to point out. So Ultra 96 training classes. This is the best place to start because it's going to give you a baseline amount of information about each of the design tools that you can use to test out new hardware, design new hardware, uh, implement stuff on the Zinc Ultra Scale Plus. So each of the courses are targeted about one day each worth of material. It's about six and a half to seven hours worth of lecture material and hands-on labs. And the key part is the hands-on labs because it'll show that you can actually walk through the tools, accomplish something, and then it's something you can go home and you can recreate um, on your own. And then we're also going to have a set of advanced courses that come out later on. One's around SDSOC. Uh, we have another one that's around pink. And for those of you who haven't heard about pink, um, you can stop by the table upstairs and I'll actually show you four separate demos that we're running. And they're all based upon the pink framework. But basically, it's a library that Xilinx created that allows interaction between the software world and hardware accelerators uh, by marshalling data across that interface. And it actually enables you to call programmable logic accelerators from Python. Uh, we also have a one on deep learning, and all these courses are going to be based on 2018.3 tools, uh, which I believe are the latest Xilinx tools that they have. And you can find out more information on it, uh, but we're also going to have an online version of these tools uh, available on the Hackster.io. If you live in a major city and you know your, Xilinx, your Avnet FAE, uh, feel free to contact them and see if you can get something scheduled uh, in terms of a live event that's taught by your local Xilinx FAE. I'm sorry, Xilinx dedicated Avnet FAE. <laughs> All right, so next, um, just kind of cover what is covered by these courses. It's going to be compatible on all Ultra 96 and Ultra 96 V2 hardware. Uh, every single kit, uh, this kit, Ultra 96 comes with a 16 gigabyte SD card. Uh, there's a separate JTAG UART pod that's purchased for that in order to get the, to the low level debugging on those. Uh, but that's available on the Avnet website. Uh, there's also a 2 amp or 4 amp power supply that's needed that does not ship with the Ultra 96. That's sold separately. Uh, the intro courses, they will cover the use of this microelectronic click mezzanine that we announced last fall. And you also use a motion sensor uh, clickboard from Microelectronica. So the pink course, we're still working out the final details on the hardware, but if you're interested in taking the deep learning course, we're also going to be using a USB webcam for doing the image capture uh, recognition. So sometime, we're going to have an announcement in April. You will need an Ultra 96 V2 board, and I'll talk a little bit about what a V2 board is. Um, if you have an Ultra 96 V1 board, you can use that too, but not everybody has one of those. Okay, so let me talk about Adam Taylor's blogs and projects. So Adam is a chartered and fellow engineer in the Institute of Engineering and Technology. Uh, he started the Micro Z Chronicles. He's been doing it since 2013 to today. He keeps on churning out new and new, new material. He's actually published those articles into two separate books that are available on Amazon in ebook format, and I believe they're also printed as well. Uh, he has all of his latest material on Ultra 96 being posted up to the Hackster.io community website, and I 
put up a little URL right here that you can go to in order to get to that and check out his work. But to kind of give you an overview of what he's done, these are some of the community projects that he has. Uh, you can see here the latest one that he had when I was putting these slides together. He integrates Alexa and Ultra 96. They're basically really quick tutorials that you can run through in a few hours in order to do something uh, incredibly amazing with your Ultra 96 hardware and usually throws in some additional hardware peripherals too. Um, but all the projects that are listed up on Haxter, uh, I don't know if you know how Haxter works, but I'll give a brief explanation. Uh, Haxter gives you the, the ability to create a sort of shopping list of hardware so you can see all the hardware that somebody used in order to create a project and you can recreate that on your own if it's something that you're interested in doing. So he has currently over 20 different projects with easy to follow instructions. Uh, the best part is Adam makes all of his project source code available and publicly on GitHub so that you can take what he's done, you can extend it, modify it, and uh, expand it on your own. Okay. So then the next thing I want to cover is documentation and reference designs on element 14. So also get questions on what is element 14. Uh, the 14th element is silicon, but element 14 is the world's largest online engineering community. So um, Abnet acquired a company named Premier Farnell, and element 14 was part of that acquisition, and it was about two years ago. Uh, we're now proud, uh, my group is now proud to be part of this community. We've actually migrated from, or we're in the process of migrating from a .org site that we were running on Drupal over this much better content management system that we have on element 14. But basically, on this website, you'll find these, they're called places, uh, but they're basically landing sites that give you all the information about a board, and if you scroll down at the bottom of this website, it has all the documentation for this board, it has all the reference designs listed for this board as well. So here's what the documentation section looks like. You can find all of, your hardware, all of our hardware user guides, all the ver different versions of schematics for all the different versions of boards that are out there. There will be the bill of materials, so if you're looking to find out what exact part was enlisted on that board uh, build, you can find that inside of uh, this documentation section. I also have the layout file, so you have a, a PDF version of layout, so if you're looking to trace down a particular trace and you need to figure out where it's routed on the board, that can be helpful. There's a net length report. So for some people that are doing high speed IO design, the net length report is incredibly important for calculating the propagation delay on the board and making sure that you're within the timing of the, the peripherals that you're plugging in. And so that's where that net length report comes in handy. The getting started guide probably should be at the top of the list, but the getting started guide uh, gives you all the instructions on downloading any sort of SD card images and getting your board up and running and how to plug in the power supply and if there's any of those pesky little switches on there that need to be in the right place in order to boot your board from the SD card, all that's covered inside of that document. There's an assembly diagram as well. Uh, that's really more um, talking about where, where the different components are placed on the board in terms of capacitors and resistors and things like that. So if you're looking for a particular component and you can't quite find that reference designator inside the silk screen, that can be useful for that. There's mechanical and drill drawing data. Uh, we get lots of questions for 3D models. For those that are printing their own enclosures, you can find a step model up there as well. And for when we design our board, we have to come up with a power solution. So our power expert, Chris Ammon, he does a lot of work on doing a power analysis. There's actually a worksheet that you can get from Xilinx that walks you through doing the analysis. Um, you tell it how much logic resources you're using on the device and which peripherals, and it'll give you a rough answer within 10 or 20 percent of how much power the d device is going to consume. So Chris does this for each of our boards, and we publish that example file so, uh, as a starting point for you to use uh, on Ultra 96. We also have these things called board definition files. And board definition files are incredibly useful for starting a new design inside of Avado and getting all the predefined 
things that you need for that particular design. And those predefined things include memory parameters for any of the memory that's on the board, for setting up the DDR memory controller. We also have all the IOs that are specific to that board mapped out inside there, and there's even pin constraints that are mapped in behind that. So if you're starting a new project, the best place to start is a board definition file. If you kind of want to go on your own, we also have the traditional XTC constraints uh, provided as a separate file as well. So you can download that and you can see where all the different pins are mapped out to and there's a corresponding uh, PCB net name that associates with that pin and that's all contained inside the constraints file that you can download. So there's a separate section that's for reference designs. And so reference designs are an excellent place to start for a new design and it provides a sort of hand holding tutorial in walking through recreating a design, but we have several designs that are available now for Ultra 96. Um, we have the factory restore image, so if you did something bad to your SD card and you need to restore it, you can download that from here. We also have that SDSOC bare metal platform. This is the same platform that Dan used to do that analysis for the matrix multiply speed up. Uh, he did it in 2018.2. There's now a 2018.3 version up there, which is the latest version of the Xilinx tools. We also have a base TRD that you can download. Um, the pink framework for Ultra 96, this is what I want to spend a little bit of time talking about. So pink is the framework that I described earlier. It has Xilinx provided open source libraries for accessing the programmable logic space from the software world. And it does that. They provide a Python library that enables you to reload the bitstream uh, inside the programmable logic and then also to access the the memory space of that from a Python application. So we got four different demos upstairs. So if you're interested in seeing like how you might be able to use that in order to rapid prototype your application, I'd be happy to talk to you more about it at the table upstairs and, and show you it in action. Yep, we got a question. Go ahead. How long does it take to reload the FPGA you know, from one design to another. Is it ten, tens of seconds or milliseconds or? That's a really good question. So the question is, how long does it take to reload the FPGA? So when I say reload the FPGA, uh, what I'm talking about is you, you load this bitstream file that contains the bit pattern to configure, uh, basically assigns the configuration memory and sets up all the different gates that are inside the device. It is completely dependent upon the density of the device. So if you have a larger device, it's going to take longer because there's more programmable logic for you to program. Um, I believe for the ZU device, it's less than a second that you're, it takes to configure it. You can actually dynamically reconfigure that. So once you have the system up and running Linux, there's actually a device that's exposed to Linux that you can just pipe a new bitstream into and you can reconfigure that bitstream on the fly from Linux. And is there any wear factor in this? I mean, you know, like a flash it gets wear if you write to it time and time again. Is there any wear factor? No, that's a really good question. So the question is, um, are there any limits to the number of times that you can reconfigure uh, an FPGA? Uh, it may be different for other FPGAs, but for Xilinx S FPGAs, it's all SRAM based, so you can reload it till the cows come home. You'll you'll never wear the thing out. Um, so going back to the tutorial, so these are very basic tutorials. So if you don't have enough time to go and take a technical training course, these t uh, tutorials are very similar. They'll walk you through creating a very basic hardware platform and then exporting that hardware platform into the Xilinx SDK, creating a first stage boot, uh, well, let's see. First thing you got to do is you got to run Hello World just to make sure you have your UART set up right. And then there's some test applications that that are on there that'll help you verify that you've set up your hardware platform correctly. Tutorial four walks you through creating the first stage bootloader and it walks you through booting your system from the micro SD card instead of launching things over JTAG. Uh, we also have an example up there on how to do accelerated image classification via a binary neural network. Um, so Craig talked about a little bit about this in his course, but there's this movement towards moving towards smaller integer types in order to get better and better efficiency out of your neural networks without uh, sacrificing a whole lot of accuracy. Uh, that one's downloadable and something you can run. And then there's also uh, 
the matrix multiply example that Dan showed last fall in Vancouver. And lots more stuff coming. Uh, we've been working really hard to get the technical training courses out, but uh, we work on reference designs all the time. So you can expect to see more stuff going up there pretty soon. Uh, looks like I got about 10 minutes left, so I'm going to try to go through this stuff as best I can. Ultra 96 support forum. So if you go on to element 14 and you search up the Ultra 96 support forums, you'll find this thing right here. You can actually get to it from this short URL that I set up right here. But basically all the folks in my group that work on Ultra 96, we're all tasked with monitoring this community. So if you ask a question here, you're going to get an answer from us. Uh, if you ask a question on Discord, there's only a few subset of us that are monitoring Discord, but all of us are responding to questions that go up on the forum. And I want to highlight on the forum, there is a real good benefit for us directing everybody to the forums is that the forums have a pretty long life cycle. And so uh, you can be sure if somebody's asking a question, you know, they'll, there's probably about 20 other people that maybe have the same question but don't know how to ask it or uh, don't know where to ask that question. And I found answers to all sorts of questions um, you know, years after the answer has been posted and others have kind of blazed the trail for me. So in terms of helping other people with their design, the best place is the, is the forums. That's the other resource that I wanted to point out as well. So Xilinx has launched a community portal and the thing that's really interesting about the community portal is that uh, any projects that are going on out there in the world that are Xilinx related, Xilinx has those customers posting those projects up here. And they get a lot of um, projects from Hackster.io feeding through to this site. Uh, there's a whole entire section that's dedicated to open source. There's a set of forums that Xilinx runs as well that are specific to like Xilinx tools and Xilinx uh, technology inside their FPGAs. Uh, they have all that accessible from this community portal. Uh, there's a Xilinx wiki that has a ton of information. In fact, I did a I did a presentation this morning on doing Secure Boot, and a ton of the information that I have of, for Secure Boot is publicly available on a, a wiki site that I posted on their course. They also have a link to the Xilinx GitHub where you can find all the open source stuff that Xilinx has posted. Uh, there's a section that's dedicated to XUP. XUP is the Xilinx University program. For, so for those of you who are involved in the academic space, uh, that may be something that you're interested in checking out. There's uh, another section that's dedicated to cloud. So Xilinx's preferred cloud provider is AWS. They do not only stuff for IoT up in the cloud, but they do a ton of machine learning stuff. And then they also um, they do a lot of stuff in terms of virtualizing their tools up inside the cloud as well. There's videos. To, uh, have a bunch of different tutorials on what you can do with Xilinx technology and then any events that Xilinx is participating in, they have those listed up there as well. So I'd encourage you to check out the Xilinx community portal. It's a great resource, uh, especially for those that are looking for the open source initiatives that Xilinx is pioneering. Ah, Ultra 96 V2. So I got a lot of questions about Ultra 96 V2, so I'm really excited about getting this video posted up so that I can kind of spread the word on it. So what is Ultra 96 V2? I got a question earlier this week from somebody and they said, well, why is it 100 euros more? Uh, there was a discrepancy on the website. We're working on getting that cleared up. That was an erroneous price that was listed. There's no change in the price for Ultra 96 V2 compared to the V1 board. It's still going to be $249, which I don't know exactly what it translates in euro, but should be should be exactly what the V1 board was sold for. So it's going to replace Ultra 96. So I got a board up here in case you want to take a look, closer look at it. But it's based upon the consumer edition of 96 boards form factor. Uh, stay, still targeted to the same applications, artificial intelligence, machine learning, embedded processing, and robotics. So what's included with that? Same thing that the V1 board was including inside of its kit. It comes with a 16 gigabyte micro SD card, which you can either run the out of box image or you can load pink image. You can load a um, binary quantized neural network demo on it. Uh, one thing that is really key about this though is it comes with an SDSOC license. And I, I believe the value of that SDSOC license is actually 
uh, way more than the board is. So this is a really good place for people to get started with STSOC. I included the part number in case you want to search up that part number if you're looking to order it. The order entry is, is open now, so you can place your order for it. Uh, the, we're not expecting the boards to ship until sometime towards the end of April, though. Excuse me. And then um, you can find more information on ultra96.org or on the 96 boards website. So here's the black diagram. Very similar to what you saw for Ultra 96 V1. Uh, you get two gigs of uh, LPDDR RAM with it. We are changing the Micron device uh, that was on the V1. That one went end of life on us. So we're putting a, another device on there that has a longer roadmap. Uh, one of the other things that's changing, uh, we have a Wi-Fi Bluetooth combo device uh, that's slightly different on the V2 board. We're actually using a microchip. It's a right, actually an Atmel Wilk 3000 device. And so this device actually has better country certification. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. <coughs> Excuse me. The other thing that's different about this device, we have a different power management IC. So the new power management IC that we have on this board, uh, it's actually a Infineon part. So uh, that particular part, uh, it has SM bus, so you can monitor like the voltage rails and stuff like that on the board and monitor your power consumption. So these are other things that changing. Uh, we had a TI power solution on there that was mm, not not all that great. It worked for V1, but this one from Infineon is better. Uh, also the microchip Wi-Fi Bluetooth. That one's also not TI that you found on the V1. This one's better, and I'll show you why. We upgraded the memory. Uh, we also have an IDT clock that's um, better. We have an Abricon crystal uh, that is easier to get than the old one. They also have a dialog on off controller and not the ADI one, which was also hard to get. Uh, we have a TI SD card controller uh, to help save the cost on there. Uh, we have TE and Molex connectors, uh, not the other more difficult to find worth and Alps connectors. And we have gone through and we've scrubbed all the components on the board to make sure that there's uh, industrial grade component options. With the exception of SD card cage and barrel jack, those are impossible to find uh, parts that are industrial rated. But everything else, uh, electrical is industrial rated. So for those of you that are just dying to run your Ultra 96 at minus 40 to plus 85, you're going to have an option for you. And you didn't have that option with V1. So here's the microchip combo, the Wi-Fi Bluetooth combo. Uh, these are all the pre-certified countries that you have available with this chipset. Uh, so you can see there, there's um, Thailand's on there. So that's really good news. So we can ship the boards into Bangkok. Um, there was another one. I think China was the other big one on here too that uh, we were looking to get on the list. But the good news is uh, Microchip's done a lot of the work for the certification, and if you do a derivative work based upon the Ultra 96 design, then you don't have to redo that certification work. You can leverage their certifications to get your product out into the rest of the world. Okay, so we're almost there. There's a few things that I added in here that I wanted to cover. So, the programmable logic advantage. Total cost of ownership can be way lower, even though you may get a little bit of a sticker shock when you find out how much FPGA devices are. Uh, we talked a little bit about this in the previous course. It actually can be lower cost in the run, in the long run, since you're getting uh, higher performance per watt of energy. Um, I think Thomas mentioned this. It's like you can save money in the long run by spending less power over the life of your product uh, if you're putting something into the data center. Um, since you can provide a hardware update to the programmable logic by downloading this new bitstream file over the air, that can help you reduce your maintenance costs by eliminating the, the need to roll a truck and send out repair technicians. Uh, it's the lowest cost custom hardware option for low to medium volume production. So unless you got a suitcase of money and you're building like a bunch of ASICs, this is going to be your best bang for your buck. 
Uh, Xilinx has an extensive IP library that they provide, and a majority of those IP cores that are included with Vivado, those are provided for free. Xilinx uh, has the best tools to quickly develop and protect your own custom programmable logic IP. And so inside those technical training courses, we actually walk you through the steps to create your own IP block. So if you're really interested in, in creating your own IP block, uh, that standardize it based upon AXI, which is an ARM Open AMBA standard, those technical training courses are really to your advantage to go through and learn how to do that. Um, so based on ARM standards, uh, we have ready to use segment solutions uh, that help you differentiate your product faster. There's tons of examples out there that both Avnet and Xilinx provide around automotive, aerospace and defense, broadcast and professional uh, audio video, consumer electronics, data center, emulation, prototyping, high performance computing, industrial, medical, test and measurement, wired and wireless communications, and now AI stuff as well. Um, so in summary, there's still some hurdles along the way. So you, you make your own IP source, uh, open, open source, but the Xilinx tools are not open source. So there's, there's some criticisms going, around, going on around that. We heard a lot of them here. Uh, it's probably not too surprising, but um, they have the best tools that are out there. Um, if somebody can do it better in open source, I, I'm sure Xonix would be open to, to listening about that. The coprocessor and the hardware accelerator design that you do requires both hardware and software skills to achieve exceptional results. So I'm sure you've been in those positions in the past where you were the software guy arguing with the hardware guy and you're at each other's throats, maybe you're pointing screwdrivers at each other, about to get messy. Um, you really have to take a system design approach when it comes to doing stuff with the FPGA. There's some stuff that you can do better in the software world. There's some stuff that you can do better inside the hardware world. And partitioning up your system properly is an, an engineering work, uh, you know, that's the art of engineering in, in balancing those trade-offs. But in the end, it's worth the effort because at the end, you have something custom that differentiates you from all your competitors, and it's hard for them to catch up with you. So we have some examples of this going on upstairs, like those guys at Rockchip and those guys at Bitmain. They created their own custom accelerator. That's their IP, they own that, and it's gonna be really hard for somebody else to copy that. Um, the one folks, they came by and they said, we prototyped it on a Xilinx platform. So Xilinx platforms are great for doing ASIC emulation. So in the end, you know, Xilinx, is a great company to work with, and Avnet, we help designers put together example designs to get that in your hands. The other benefit is you get the exact hardware peripheral set that you need for your ARM-based application. So since everything based on Axie interconnects, you get the exact peripheral set. You need 50 I2C peripherals, I, uh, 50 I2C master peripherals on there. You just got to get a part that's big enough to drop diff 50 different I2C AXI cores inside the programmable logic. Uh, you can secure your smart hardware and your own intellectual property deep within the fabric of your design. I had a course that talked a little bit more about security. You can actually cryptographically sign and encrypt your bitstream file so that nobody can go in there and reverse engineer it and create a set of uh, products, set of your products that they're selling out on the gray market. You can also future-proof your design by enabling you to do some update of that hardware through just a downloadable update. So uh, imagine that you could do a hardware update by just downloading um, the latest uh, software update to your product. And inside of that, you have packed a bitstream file that updates to programmable logic. Uh, one more thing I want to mention. Still got a few minutes here left. Um, this is a really cool program that I actually just found out about, but it's been going on for over a year. There is a path to programmable program. Uh, it's been run by Element 14, uh, our colleague Jason, uh, my old colleague Jason Mathurum, Craig's current colleague Jason Mathurum. Uh, he's been working on this with Element 14 folks, and it's around the Mini Z hardware. These guys started back in July. Uh, we took a set of folks and we set them down a training path to train them up on how to use the Xilinx tools. Um, they were required as part of this program to start a new project and blog on their work up on Element 14. Um, but what they got out of it is some really cool stuff. So they got a book on how to design with Xilinx FPGAs. They got this really super fancy Flute Connect multimeter 
And then they also got a pros kit electronic toolkit. So that, that way if they did some hardware customization, they had the tools to do that. So talking to some of the folks, we're gonna start a new program, it looks like. So if you know anybody or if you yourself are as interested in enrolling, uh, please stop by and talk to me and we can capture your details and make sure you get on the list. So out of time here. So I just wanna thank the following people. Uh, Thomas Carrick, he's a retired electronics engineer. That's my dad. He's the one who helped me dump, dive inside the dumpster and fish out that x86 machine that I was showing on the first slide. Uh, Ron Wright, he is actually my predecessor. So he's a retired software engineer. He used to work for Avnet. I based a lot of the information on some presentations that he put together quite a while ago around the Microblaze processor that's running on the Avnet stuff. So I have a lot of, wanna pass out some kudos to him because I wouldn't be in the place where I, I am today without Ron's help. Uh, also, Adam Taylor, he's also an electronics engineer. He's done a ton of work that we've been able to capitalize on at Avnet. Also, Dan Roswood for putting together the training at, shown at Vancouver last fall. He's a terrific engineer to work with and uh, really, really smart when it comes to the SDSOC tool. He knows that tool inside and out. And then I also want to thank Brian Fletcher. He's uh, my old boss. He actually encouraged me to put together this presentation because we get tons and tons of questions from folks on where to get started with using FPGAs. So I thank you all for attending. And if you guys have any questions, I think we have maybe like a few more minutes before we get kicked out. Um, but thank you all. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me.